Welcome back, everyone. So, the episode begins right where we left off last time, with Roger informing both Mello and Nier that Elle is dead. And I really like this scene because it serves as a great introduction to both of these characters, as we're first meeting them at a pivotal moment in their lives. Because Ryuzaki, or rather Elle, was their mentor. You can kind of think of them as the Robins to Elle's Batman. In fact, as we'll soon find out, one of them was even meant to eventually inherit the title themselves, but we'll dive deeper into that in just a second. But anyway, like I said, L was their mentor, and now we're seeing how they're reacting to the news of his death. And their responses couldn't be more different. Because while Mello immediately succumbs to his emotions and starts frantically asking for information surrounding what happened, Nier is, well, pretty nonchalant and borderline callous about the news. What did you just say? He's dead? But, but how? Was it Kira? Did Kira kill him? If you can't win the game... If you can't solve the puzzle, then you're just a loser. And this interaction really does tell you a lot about who these guys are. Like, without getting too far ahead of myself, I want to take note of how Mello immediately lashed out. Like how I said a second ago, he let himself succumb to his emotions. And notice how the emotion he displayed wasn't necessarily sadness. Like he didn't break down and start crying. No, he got aggressive. Like he grabbed Roger by the shoulders to the point where the old man had to call out his name so that he let him go. He's been killed? <laughs> Mello. Like I said, aggressive, which is obviously ironic given his name is Mello. If anything, one could argue that that name fits his counterpart a lot better, because his response was much calmer, or maybe colder might be a better way to put it. And much like Mello's aggressive nature is one of his defining traits, Nier's coldness or detachment is one of his, as is his obsession with puzzles and other games of the sort. Now, aside from that, I also found it interesting that basically everything Mello has said so far has been a question, whereas Nier has only made statements. Which, I mean, I don't know if I have anything really deeper to mention with that, but it's just something that I noticed. Mello is kind of desperate to get some clarity on the situation, whereas Nier is just like, okay. Anyway, Mello's line of questioning doesn't stop there, as the next thing he asks Roger is, So... Which of us did L pick, me or Nier? And this is where it's kind of made clear who these kids are. Because up until he says that, you really don't have any idea who the hell they're supposed to be and why they're the ones being told about L's passing. Because it's not like L ever brought up the fact that he and Watari were secretly grooming these two to take over for him at some point in the future. But yeah, it's like I said a minute ago. They're essentially a couple of Robins vying over who'll become the next Batman. But... Uh, unfortunately for them, he hadn't chosen yet. And this really upsets Mello. However, Nier still doesn't really seem to care all that much. Like, at all. He hasn't even stopped working on his puzzle this whole time. Meanwhile, Mello's over here looking like he's about to burst into tears. Like, I don't even know this kid, and yet I can't help but feel bad for him. Like, look at his face. It's clear that getting Elle's approval meant something to him. And now Kira has denied him the opportunity to ever find out if he was the one who would have been chosen. But yeah, desperate to find some kind of way to move forward with this situation, Roger implies that perhaps the two of them could work together. And Nier actually says, All right, sounds good. And <laughs> just look at Mello's face after he says that shit. Like, that's <laughs> actually hilarious. Because I have never seen a facial expression that screamed fuck that quite as loudly as his is right here. And this actually makes sense from what we've seen so far. Like we're only a minute into this scene and Mello's body language has made it abundantly clear that he has some sort of issue with Nier. Like when Nier called Elle a loser, we saw Mello tense up, like he was angry with him for saying it. Furthermore, when Roger implied that perhaps the two of them could work together, we see Mello clench his teeth in response, which then leads to him making <laughs> this face after Nier agreed to it. And uh, okay, so Nier, I mean, in a lot of obvious ways, is very reminiscent of L. His tone, his demeanor, his posture, and with him saying that the idea of working with Mello sounds good, I, like, I can't help but think about what happened between L and Aizawa back in episode 18, with how Aizawa was clearly annoyed with L when he said, I've always hated Ryuzaki. And yet L still came back and responded with, That's too bad. Because I like you, Aizawa. And the reason it reminds me of that is because it seems so obvious that Mello just 
doesn't fuck with him. Hell, the fact that Roger is trying to convince them to work together tells me that it must be an issue for at least one of them. And if it isn't near, then it must be Mello. But anyway, Mello ultimately goes on to say that working with Nier is not an option, claiming, You know I don't get along with Nier. And he deadass might as well have just said, I don't no, fuck with no. you. But yeah, he also mentions the fact that they've always competed against each other, even making sure to say it twice to really get his point across. We've always competed against each other. Always. And after he says that, it just gets quiet. Like, really quiet. Like 13 seconds of just silence with the only sound coming from the wind blowing hard outside. And honestly, it just feels really awkward. And I don't say that in a negative way, I think that it's meant to feel that way. Especially with this shot of Mello staring at Roger as if he's hoping he'll have something to say in response, which is then followed by this shot of Roger with his head down and his eyes closed, which basically translates to... I don't know what to tell you, man. And all the while, Nier is just continuing to put together his puzzle, seemingly completely unfazed by what's going on. And I just really like how it feels like they managed to convey a lot without actually saying anything. Because by the end of the 13 seconds, the silence is broken by Mello as he says, You know what? It's fine. And at first I thought it seemed like he might just be pouting? Like he says this off screen and I was half expecting to see him petulantly folding his arms when the camera turned back to him. But no, in actuality he's being sincere, as he follows it up with, Nier should be the one to succeed Elf. He's not like me, he never gets emotional, he just uses his head like it's a game or a puzzle. And I mean, I gotta be honest, that shows a certain level of maturity on his part. Like, he obviously wanted to be chosen, but it's clear to him now that he's just not the right person for the role. He's just not emotionally competent enough to take on the role of L. Like, he's clearly intelligent enough, otherwise he wouldn't even be in the running. But given what we've seen from him in just the last two minutes, it's clear that he's hot-headed and quick to aggression. And that just doesn't really work in regard to being L. And shit, mad respect to him for owning up to it. That's actually pretty impressive, especially given his age. But uh, to kind of go back to what I said about the last two minutes, I want to point out that we're exactly one minute and 54 seconds into this episode at this point, and Nier has just completed the puzzle again. I say again because at the 44 second mark, after we saw him dump all of the pieces to his puzzle on the floor, we see him start to work on the puzzle from the start again, meaning... Uh, he completed this whole puzzle in about a minute and 10 seconds, which is insane. Like, even if we say that that 13 second pause from earlier was actually longer, I mean, it couldn't have been that long, meaning he still probably finished this in less than, say, two and a half or three minutes. That's still pretty impressive, even more so when you consider the fact that it's mostly a blank puzzle, meaning there's not really any pattern to work with. But yeah, I just thought I'd point that out because, I mean, it definitely speaks to his intelligence. Anyway, from there, Mello tells Roger that he's getting the hell out of here, and by here, he means the Whammy's house. And while Roger does try to stop him, Mello ends up responding by saying, Don't waste your breath. I'm almost 15 years old. It's time I started living my own life. Which, uh, no, that's not how that works, my guy. You're 14. There's no way in hell Roger's just gonna let you leave without doing something. Did he just, did he just walk out while I was talking? Can he, can he do that? The fuck? Anyway, from there, we move back to 2012, which, as we established in the previous video, will be our new present day going forward. But anyway, things to pick back up in the... Oval office? Which, uh, <laughs> okay, that's different. But like I was saying, we find our new friend Nier in the Oval office, where we discover that he's been busy working on the Kida investigation. And he's gotten pretty far. A police officer who happened to be nearby during Higuchi's arrest overheard him talking about a notebook. If you write a person's name in it with their face in mind, that person will die. And yeah, he knows pretty much everything. Higuchi, the Death Note, how to use it. Hell, he was even able to deduce that the NPA must still have it in their possession, and that they're the ones that are currently acting as the new L. And mind you, this wasn't information that was sent to him from L. Like, all Nier had to go off of is the fact that the real L, his mentor, was dead, and that Kida was the one who likely killed him. And using that as a starting point, he managed to uncover 
well, like I said, basically everything. And while it is impressive, I kind of appreciate the fact that it's not quite as impressive as what Ryuzaki did, at least not from the perspective of how long it took for him to get to this point. And I don't say that to denigrate Nier, I say it because it feels more realistic. Like, Ryuzaki was the world's greatest detective, so it made sense that he was able to hone in on Kira so quickly, managing to uncover his identity in less than a year. And speaking of a year, I hadn't noticed this before, but that transmission that Ryuzaki had set up to auto-deliver to Roger was sent out exactly a year after he confronted Kira. Like, I had mentioned both dates in the last video, but just didn't notice that they were the same day. December 5th, 2006, and December 5th, 2007. But anyway, like I was saying, Nier did what Ryuzaki was able to do, but it took him about four times as long. And part of that is because Nier isn't at Ryuzaki's level yet. And again, I'm not saying this to talk shit about him, it's just a fact. I mean, Ryuzaki was in his mid-twenties when he started the Kira investigation, whereas Nier was around 13 or 14 when he started working on it. They're just not the same, and that's okay. He's still proven that he's more than capable of getting shit done. Which is why when the president asks the director of the FBI, who, fun fact, we've actually met before back in episode 5, but uh, when the president asks him who Nier is, he responds by saying, Sir, Nier is, well in a sense you could call him the true successor to L. And it's true. And before we move on, I actually want to talk about something that I thought was really interesting, and it's in regard to Nier and Mello's themes, both of which have been played at different points during the opening of this episode. And the reason I want to bring them up is because I found it so interesting how they compare to L's theme. Like, L and Nier's theme start off very similarly. In fact, during this moment of the episode, I thought it was L's theme that was playing, as if they were trying to bolster the fact that Nier is the true successor to L. But after looking into it, I realized that it was actually Nier's own theme. And from there, I decided to go back and listen to Mello's theme to see how it compared. And it starts off very differently. Like it's a completely different kind of song. Like where Nier and L's themes employ the use of a piano at the start, Mello's starts off with a soft guitar. However, while the beginning of L and Mello's themes are different, when you get to the latter half of the song, they do actually start sounding kind of similar. Because L's theme actually introduces a guitar, and in both cases, the guitar riffs get very aggressive and sound very similar. Whereas with the latter half of Nier's theme, while it does start employing the use of strings to accompany the piano, it never gets quite as aggressive as L and Mello's. So I guess what I'm saying is L's theme is quite literally a sort of perfect blend of both Anir and Mello's themes. Or I guess a more apt way of putting it would be that when you combine Anir and Mello's themes, you pretty much get L's theme. And I thought that was really cool. A lot of thought seems to have been put into Hideki Taniuchi's score for this anime, and I dig it. But anyway, the final part of this opening sequence continues the exposition started during the last scene, as it informs us that Nier has partnered with the old US of A and started his own task force, separate from that of the NPA's Kira task force. And Nier's group, which is composed of members of the FBI and CIA, is known as the Special Provision for Kira, or SPK for short. And yeah, with all of that being said, episode 27, Abduction. So, the episode proper starts off at the Yagami house, where we get to experience one of the very few slice of life moments of this anime, where things are just kinda chill, you know? The family's hanging out and stuff, drinking tea or coffee or whatever, you know, just good vibes and- If you ask me, it's the people doing that who deserve to die. Well, it was nice while it lasted, I guess. But anyway, what Matsuda is referencing is the fact that apparently in recent months, or maybe for the last five years, people have started posting names and faces to the internet in the hopes that Kira will kill those people, which 
I mean, you know what? I wonder how this was received when it initially came out. Because this anime, or I guess more so the manga of which this anime is based on, came out during the infancy of the internet. Like the majority of people using the internet in the early 2000s were using, wait for it, like literally wait for it to connect. There we go, dial up. Y'all remember dial up, right? Please say yes, because I am too young to be the, well, back in my day guy just yet. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just super curious if this aspect of the story was viewed as like a, a radical train of thought. Like, I wonder if someone watched or read this when it came out and thought, oh, people wouldn't act like that. Meanwhile, 20 years later, you have people openly referring to themselves as stands and doing all manner of fucked up shit on the internet, like doxing or worse yet, swatting people. And it's just, I, ugh. When you look back at this story, you realize that Oba Sensei really understood the human condition. Anyway, something I wanted to point out is the fact that Matsuda goes on to say that Kira would never kill the people making those posts because that's how he gets his information and in response to that misa says <laughs> mata you silly you've got it all backwards and for the life of me i didn't understand what she meant like backwards are you saying that they get their information from kira because that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense so i went ahead and brought up the japanese subtitles you know just in case it might be a little translation snafu and it seems like it might be because in the japanese version misa says <laughs> Which, sorry, translates to Matsu, your idea is full of contradictions. And that makes a bit more sense. Like, I imagine she's telling him that it's a bit contradictory to say that people who post names and faces should die. Because in saying that, it kind of makes him just as bad as them. And what I mean is, the people posting names and faces believe that certain people should die for things they've done. And here Matsuda is saying that he thinks those people should die for the thing that they've done. Like it's it's basically the same thing is what she's implying. Anyway, Light goes on to share his thoughts, claiming that he can understand why people would rally behind Kira the way that they do. To them, the world's become a good place for innocent people who lead good lives. Which I mean, he, he's not wrong. I can also understand why people would support Kira, especially if Kira has influenced your life directly, such as with Misa and the dude who killed her parents. Think of how many Misas are probably out there, grateful to Kira for killing the person that ruined their life. Anyway, after Light says this, Ryuk lets out a little chuckle, and I just couldn't help but smile. And you know what, fun fact, I haven't actually rewatched this series since I started making these videos. So it's been like over two years since I watched these later episodes. So in a way, this feels new and fresh and it's cool. This might actually be the longest I've gone without rewatching the series in its entirety. It was usually a yearly affair. But anyway, Light's internal monologue takes it a step further, as he says that everyone in the world will soon support Kira. And I mean, if he isn't stopped, I don't see any reason to really disagree with him on that. But yeah, after this, Sachiko drops in with some drinks and basically tells them to quit it with the Kira talk for a bit. And it's interesting because she's really the only normal person here right now. The only person who's not in that world. Like everyone else here is either chasing Kira, obsessed with Kira, or, well, <laughs> is Kira. But Sachiko's just a regular woman living her life, mostly unbothered by Kira and what they're doing. Like it just doesn't really affect her all that much. Well, not at the moment, anyway. Also, <laughs> I want to point out that while Sachiko is putting out the drinks, we just see Misa thirsting after light. Like, she's looking at him, how I'd be looking at my wife. <laughs> but yeah, after this, we get a surprise visit from Sayu, and she's not a kid anymore. Like, she's definitely had the most drastic change during this time jump. Well, so far, anyway. Jeez, you're all grown up. And pretty. All right, chill, Leo. I think she's a little too young for you. And it doesn't help things that he follows that up by saying, Last time I saw you, you were this big. <laughs> and it's just a little weird. Like, obviously, Masada is not a creepy dude. If anything, I'd argue that he'd want to be with her just so that he can have an excuse to call the chief dad. <laughs> but still, 11 years is a hell of an age gap. Especially since, by his own admission, he's been around long enough to have watched her grow up. So, yeah. 
Yeah. But anyway, overall, the interaction is very jovial and lighthearted. From Matsuda calling the chief and Sachiko mom and dad. You're too cruel to me, mom and dad. Mom? To Sayu shutting Matsuda's old ass all the way down. I was thinking if you were a little younger, I might have considered going out with you sometime. Oh. To Light proudly joking about how his little sister's all grown up. <laughs> Yes, my little sister is all grown up, isn't she? Only for Misa to fuck it up by, like, <laughs> existing. You're just as wonderful and handsome as when I first met you! Like, look at how angry he looks. Like, I am genuinely curious as to how he managed to put up with her for the last five years while having such disdain for her as a person. I would honestly love to see a one-shot of their life together during the time jump. I imagine that'd be <laughs> so interesting. But yeah, the whole scene's a lot of fun, and it's all followed up perfectly by Ryuk thinking to himself, A heartwarming scene from the most unfortunate family in the world. And yeah, <laughs> he's right. I honestly couldn't have said it better myself. But unfortunately, that's it for the good times. Because right after Ryuk says that, the chief gets a call and apparently there's been a kidnapping. Involving who? They got director Takimura of the MPA. And yeah, someone has taken the director. The director of the NPA, which is <laughs> shit, that's actually nuts. You don't normally hear about cops being kidnapped, especially not directors of the police force. But anyway, while they're driving to headquarters, we end up hearing Matsuda say, As if we don't have enough on our plate already with the Kira case. And I'm just like, do you, though? <laughs> like, what progress have y'all actually made towards finding Kira? Because seeing as you were just kicking it with Light and Misa, I'm gonna take a wild guess and say y'all ain't done shit for the last five years. Like, what? Anyway, they head inside, and the first thing we see is that the Chief's got a new office, and title to go with it. So apparently, he's the deputy director, but <laughs> to be clear, You'll always be the chief to me. Which is why I will be continuing to refer to him as the chief. But yeah, we can see that the gang's all here, plus Ide, apparently. I guess with Rizaki gone, he's joined the task force full time again. And I mean, that's cool, I guess. Something I'm curious about, though, is whether or not they had him touch the notebook. Because if not, that might have been reason enough to have him around. Someone who knows everything, but isn't at risk of dying if something happens to the notebook. But yeah, with the other detectives having already confirmed that the kidnapper's claim was legitimate, given the fact that the call from the kidnappers originated from Director Takimura's phone, the chief goes on to ask if the kidnappers made any sort of ransom, and Aizawa confirms that they did. And well, they want to trade the director for the notebook. And this immediately catches them all off guard, especially considering the fact that, according to Light, they never informed anyone outside of this room about the existence of the notebook. And while that may be true, we, as the audience, have already had it confirmed that the information surrounding the notebook has definitely been leaked. Because Nier mentioned earlier in this episode that an officer overheard Higuchi mention something about a notebook when they apprehended him. Which means that it was very likely one of these six dudes who leaked the information, seeing as they're the only ones within earshot. And to be fair, I'm not even going to talk shit about them because if I had heard something as crazy as I've got a special notebook, if I write someone's name in it while thinking of their face, that person dies. I would have had to have told someone, you know, probably my wife if no one else. So if they went on to tell someone and then that person told someone and so on and so forth, then I could see how it could have eventually reached near, especially if he's throwing around FBI slash CIA money. I mean, grease somebody's palms enough and the information will just start flowing. But the thing is, is this something Nier would do? Kidnap the director of the MPA? And really, it wouldn't even be Nier doing it. It would be members of the FBI and CIA. And would they do that? I mean, I would argue that that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense and could likely lead to some serious issues between the two nations. So if it's not Nier, then who else could it be? I guess we'll find out soon enough, but for now, we'll wrap this scene up as we transition to the following day, where we find an FBI agent visiting the NPA headquarters, seeking to have an audience with Director Takimura. However, with him, well, obviously a little busy at the moment, the chief meets with the agent instead, and FBI agent John McEnroe wastes no time getting down to business. I'll get straight to the point. The Japanese police have proven themselves to be unreliable. So in order to solve the cure case, we want you to hand over the notebook to us. And this immediately sets the chief off, as he incorrectly jumps to the conclusion that the FBI are behind the kidnapping. Though, <laughs> 
Honestly, it wouldn't be completely unreasonable to have gone off on him for how much of an asshole he was. He was basically like, y'all ain't done shit in the last five years, so why don't you go ahead and run me that notebook so we can show you how it's done. And <laughs> while it was rude, it's not like he's wrong. I mean, it's been five years and even without knowing what y'all have been doing, it's clear that you're no closer to finding Kira. Like it's painfully and quite frankly, embarrassingly obvious how little progress y'all have made. But anyway, the chief isn't necessarily upset by this guy calling them incompetent, so much as he is the fact that he believes that he and his people have taken the director, which like I just said, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, don't get me wrong, I can understand the knee-jerk reaction to thinking it. It's like the kidnappers also demanded the notebook. So, I mean, the fact that this dude is now coming in here asking for the notebook does seem pretty suspicious. But when you consider the fact that he came in here wanting to speak to the director, it makes a lot less sense for him to also have been the one to have kidnapped him. Like, this dude doesn't even know that the director has been kidnapped. But he and the other members of the SBK are now aware of that. Because unbeknownst to the chief, John McEnroe here is wearing a wire. And with Nier now aware of what's going on too, he tells his agent to inform the chief that they'll help them with finding director Takimura. Going on to add, We'll take a notebook once we have the opportunity. So now we see that the two task forces will be working together, though it's obvious that Nier's only doing it so that it'll be easier to retrieve the notebook from them. But here's the thing, if Nier didn't grab the director, then who could it be? Because not only would this person, or rather group of people, need to have the resources to successfully kidnap a member of law enforcement, but they'd also have to be smart enough to have figured out that the NPA was in possession of the death note. So who could it be? Hmm, perhaps it's someone who, you know what, no, I'm not doing this shit, it's mellow, it's clearly fucking mellow, it wouldn't even make any sense for it to be anyone else. And yeah, the show wastes no time in making that clear. But I do want to take note of how <laughs> crazy that is. Like this man, or boy at the time, was a potential candidate to become the next L. You know, the same L that works with the police on solving major crimes. And yet here he is having kidnapped the highest ranking officer in Japan. Like he's, <laughs> he's definitely taken a different path. Because you see these dudes? Yeah, they're the mafia and they're taking their orders from him. Well, in actuality, they're taking their orders from this guy, Rod, but Rod basically listens to whatever Mello says, which is <laughs> impressive, very impressive, really. Like, honestly, when you think about it, Mello has actually proven to be more capable than Nier. More unorthodox, clearly, but also more capable, because they both seem to have learned about the existence of the Death Note and the fact that the MPA was currently in possession of it. But the difference is, Mello ultimately struck first, and <laughs> as their mentor once said, He who strikes first wins. And Mello has won. Well, this round, anyway, because while the director himself doesn't know anything about the Death Note, he does have information that Mello will be able to use to his favor, specifically the names of those currently working with L. So Ichiro Yagami, Kanzo Mogi, and Tota Matsuda. And there are a couple things I want to say about this, starting with the fact that that's only half the team. I mean, I get that the director didn't know that Light is L and Watari, but you're telling me that he also doesn't know that Light is working on the case? Like, at all? And what about Ide and Aizawa? I mean, I guess I can kind of understand not knowing about Ide since he left the investigation before they ever even met L in person. And hell, now that I think about it, Ide never did actually meet L in person. Like, unless he went up to the helicopter to say hello, which I mean, I doubt that, then he wouldn't have had any other opportunity to meet him. But look, even if I excuse Ide, which is really kind of hard to do given they've all been working on this for the last five years, but whatever, even if I did, I can't can't really do the same for Aizawa, because he's been working on the case this whole time. Sure, he left the task force for a bit, but he was still clearly working on the investigation while he was gone, because he was the one who ended up organizing folks to help them apprehend Higuchi on October 28th. So like, what? The director can't be that oblivious as to what's going on in his organization, right? 
The Japanese police have proven themselves to be unreliable. Well, <laughs> shit, maybe John was right. I mean, the only thing I can think of is that maybe they didn't tell him who was working on the investigation. But then, I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either, because the director even goes as far as to tell them about Ukita too. There was also Ukita, but he was killed by Kira. So if you could tell them about Ukita, who died four months into the investigation back in April of 2007, then why not tell them about Aizawa, since he actually only left the investigation for less than a month, with him leaving on October 2nd and coming back, like I said a minute ago, on October 28th. Like, that doesn't make sense unless you're just trying to protect him. Which, I mean, that's cool, I, I guess, but just, <laughs> does that mean fuck everyone else then? And also, now that I think about it, screw this guy for snitching at all. Like, you're here compromising the safety of your subordinates, bro. Like, man, <laughs> you ain't shit. Like, I'm really having a hard time feeling bad for you because from what I'm seeing, it doesn't really look like they've done much to you. Meanwhile, I know a teenage girl who withstood three days of straight up torture without saying shit. Like, bro, what the fuck? But whatever. After Mello's guys talk a little shit about Takimura, Mello comes in and asks the director to confirm that the chief is the highest ranking member amongst the three that he listed, which the director confirms. Mello then goes on to explain his theory regarding the current state of the investigation. There are two notebooks out there. One of them is in Kira's possession, the others with the NPA. And I mean, he's not wrong. Well, not completely wrong. But to be fair, that's not exactly a hard assumption to come up with. I mean, if the MPA does have a notebook, which they should, given they got it from Higuchi, then it seems unlikely that they'd be the ones using it and acting as Kira. I mean, <laughs> One of them is, but that's kind of besides the point. The NPA, as an organization, wouldn't be using it. So that means that there is another notebook that exists, and Kira must be in possession of it. The only thing he got wrong is the fact that there are actually three notebooks, one belonging to the NPA and one belonging to both Misa and Light, respectively. But at this point, there isn't really a Kira and second Kira. They're just both acting as the definitive Kira. Anyway, Mello then goes on to say, We're gonna take both of them. Which is <laughs> quite a claim to just throw out there. And while these two seem kind of skeptical about it, Rod believes in Mello's ability. Mostly because It's been a year and a half since he joined us, and in that entire time he's never been wrong about anything. Which, okay, that's interesting. So this kind of goes to show us a few things. One, how long he's been hanging out with these guys. Two, the fact that on top of working on this investigation, he's also been helping them out with, uh, Mafia stuff? <laughs> like, apparently he was able to bring us the head of a mafia boss that even Kira himself couldn't kill. Which is kind of cool. And it also brings me to the third thing, which is it serves to further cement his skills as a detective. Because bringing down the head of a mafia organization, that's a pretty big deal. And to digress for just a second, it's interesting to me that Light didn't get to that person before Mello. And it makes me wonder what kind of criminals Light is going after. Like he didn't get that mafia boss and clearly this guy, Rod, also hasn't been caught. So I'm curious as to what the demographic is like for Kira's victims. Like I would love to see a breakdown of the people he's killed sorted by the type of crime they've committed. But again, I digress. Anyway, one of the guys asks Mello why he's so adamant about getting the notebook in the first place, and he goes on to say that it's not so much about the Death Note itself, but more so his desire to eliminate his competition, by which he means near. Also, I see you repping the scouts, Mello. I dig it. Anyway, from there, we switch over to our old friend Light Yagami, as he stares uh, menacingly at himself in the mirror, while standing in a, a library? What the fuck am I looking at here? Whatever, don't think about it. Just know that he's clearly about to write someone's name down. So yeah. Anyway, welcome back to How To Use It. Oh yeah, we're back, baby. If you just write die of accident for the cause of death, the victim will die from an actual accident after six minutes and 40 seconds. And I, <sighs> so this is bullshit. And can anyone tell me why this is bullshit? Anyone? Bonus points if you can also point out the two episodes that prove this rule is bullshit. Like seriously, feel free to pause and type out your answer. Okay, ready? 
So the reason why it's bullshit is because we've seen the accidental death rule play out on two separate occasions. Really, three, but one of them was pre-written a few hours before it happened, so we're not going to count that one. So still, there are two examples of this being used. One from episode 23, and the other is actually from episode 1. In both of those episodes, a person's name was written in the notebook as an accidental death, and they died almost immediately. In episode 23, Higuchi wrote the traffic cop's name down and then took off. And within a minute, or more likely 40 seconds, he ended up crashing his bike and dying. Like, you're not gonna convince me that that cop chased Higuchi for six minutes and 40 seconds before even attempting to call for backup. This is traffic control squad. Just like you're not going to convince me that these dudes attempted to assault this girl for 6 minutes and 40 seconds. Or that Light just stood here pretending to read this magazine while staring at them for 6 minutes and 40 seconds before the Death Note finally activated and had this guy get run over. Like this is actually one of the more egregious issues surrounding a rule because there's really no way to make it make sense. But whatever, just... <laughs> Just don't think about it. Also, the rules are red now. So is the title card and also the ending card, which I forgot to mention. But anyway, next up, even though only one name is written in the Death Note, if it influences and causes other humans that are not written in it to die, the victim's cause of death will be a heart attack. So this one is interesting because it actually reminded me of the rule from back in episode 14. Whether the cause of the individual's death is either a suicide or accident, if the death leads to the death of more than the intended, the person will simply die of a heart attack. This is to ensure that others' lives are not influenced. So yeah, I don't really know if I have anything extra to add here since we've basically already covered it. But actually, you know what? For shits and giggles, since it's been brought up here on more than one occasion, what are y'all's thoughts on what might happen if someone used the death note to write down the name of a pilot while they were flying a plane 30,000 feet in the air? And nothing fancy in regards to the death, just a standard heart attack. What do you think would happen? Would it happen immediately? Would it negate it altogether? Would it cause the death to be delayed until after people were no longer at risk? Or would it make it so that the plane crashed in such a way that no one else was injured? I'm personally thinking that it would delay the death until people were no longer at risk, given what the rule states anyway, but let me know in the comment section. Alright, so upon our return, we immediately come to find out that director Takimura is dead, and apparently, Takimura hung himself with his tie somehow. Which, damn, a hell of a way to go out. But I mean, it's not like he chose to do that. No, that decision was made by Light. And honestly, I mean, at this point, nothing really surprises me with Light anymore. I mean, it's not like this is even the first member of law enforcement that he's killed. But I will say that it is the first Japanese officer that he's gone after. But yeah, Kira killed the director, and while Melo can't prove that it was Kira, he feels like it's a pretty safe bet that that's what happened. And I would agree, it seems random for the director to kill himself after only being here a couple of days. And if he had the opportunity to break free and use his tie to hang himself, then why not at least try to escape? You know? And look, while I understand the logic behind Light's decision, seeing as he didn't want the director to give too much information away, which, <laughs> I mean, one, too late for that, and two, it's not like he knew all that much anyway. But regardless, while I understand the logic behind the decision, it definitely didn't do him any favors. Like, at all. <laughs> Because in doing that, he's now basically confirmed two things for Mello. One is the fact that Kira has no idea who they are, because if he did, then he would have just killed them instead. And two, whoever Kira is, he has to be someone with ties to the MPA, seeing as he knew to kill the director, despite the fact that news of him being abducted had not been made public. So yeah, now, using the information provided to him by the director, while also acting under the assumption that Kira was the one who killed the director, Mello says that their next step will be to kidnap... Hmm, well, I'll, I'll hold off on revealing that for just a minute. Anyway, we switch scenes to Light's apartment. Now, currently, the task force is just kind of waiting for something to happen. It's been a few days at this point, and they haven't gotten any closer to figuring out the whereabouts of the director. In fact, they don't even know that he's dead yet, seeing as the kidnappers haven't reached back out to them. The only thing they do know at this point is the real name of the FBI agent who had met with the chief the other day. According to his personnel file, he's actually called Larry Connors. 
uh, what? How? How do you fuck that up? I mean, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised, given the way this show be butchering the spelling of people's names. But it's so weird to have them say the right name while having the wrong one on the screen. Anyway, regarding the director, Light starts wondering why the kidnappers haven't reached out yet. They gonna give up on the deal just because they lost their bargaining chip? I didn't think our opponents would be such pushovers. And it's weird because he seems almost disappointed by their lack of follow through. Or maybe it's not weird. Maybe after five years of doing basically nothing, it was kind of a nice change of pace to have something exciting happen for once. And I mean, if it's excitement that he's looking for, well, <laughs> he'll have plenty of that in the weeks to come. But anyway, Light goes on to tell the others that they're gonna need to be careful, because while the director didn't know anything about the Death Note, he did have knowledge regarding who was working with L, and therefore, any of them could be targets. Which. Yeah, that is worth pointing out, especially because we know for a fact that Mello has every intention of kidnapping someone else in order to get what he wants. Anyway, while Light continues to tell them to be on high alert, we see, uh, we see, uh, <laughs> Hey, Mesa. Uh, I, I, I mean, we see Mesa stroll in and say, I'll be a good girl and go to bed by myself, okay? And Light, <laughs> fucking Light, is just unfazed. Yeah, good night. Which, my goodness, bro. Like, these dudes are over here practically salivating over his girl, and he just doesn't care. Like, even I, who honestly didn't understand all the hype before, can, at the very least, acknowledge that Time Skip Mesa's a bit of a baddie. And yet Light just... <laughs> just doesn't care. That's, all right, whatever. But anyway, that's enough fan service for now. Where, where was I? Oh yeah, after Misa scurries off to bed, Light has a revelation. It just occurred to me, we're not the only ones in danger here. Our families are at risk. And that's a really good point. However, before they get the chance to really talk about it, the chief gets a call from the director's cell phone, and the person on the other end of the line is... Mello. And Mello is quick to fess up about the director's fate, letting them know that the deal to trade him for the notebook has been cancelled because he's dead. But before the chief gets the opportunity to ask what happened, Mello follows it up by saying, It's only cancelled though regarding the director. The new deal is this. The notebook for Sayu Yakami. And yeah, these dudes took his daughter. And while it's a pretty fucking sadistic move on their part, it's also a masterful one from a strategic standpoint. Because think about it, with director Takimura gone, the chief is now the acting director. Furthermore, Mello knows that the chief was one of the three men working with L on the Kira investigation, meaning if there's anyone who could get their hands on the notebook, it would be him. And sure, they could try and kidnap him, but given what just happened to director Takimura, it's obvious that all of the higher ups are going to be on high alert. So if not the chief himself, then how about someone close to him? His wife? Well, who's to say what their relationship is like? Hell, for all they know, he may hate his wife, or he might be willing to sacrifice her for the greater good of the world. So what about his son? Well, he's a cop too, and very likely would be just as hard to get to right now. Which leaves his daughter. And what good, honest man wouldn't be willing to do absolutely anything to save his daughter? It's, it's brilliant in the most fucked up kind of way. And yeah, Mello goes on to lay out the typical kidnapper spiel. No cops, no help, follow my instructions, and if you don't do as I say, I'll kill your daughter. That's right. Just as easily as we killed the director. Now, I will say that the addition of that last line is also brilliant on their part. Like, in taking credit for the kill, it shows that they mean business, you know? Like, from the perspective of the task force, it makes it seem like if they were willing to kill the director of the NPA, do we really think they'd have any problem killing one's daughter? And yeah, after that, he just hangs up, leaving the chief, and really everyone, Light included, shocked. Like, these people are not messing around, and now the task force has no choice but to go along with what they want. Because, I mean, you know the chief is going to be willing to give up the death note in order to get his daughter back, and it's not like anyone here is going to fight him on that. But anyway, moments after the call, the chief does his due diligence and calls home, and at the same time, Light tries calling his sister's phone directly. Now, with Light, the line just rings, and we get a shot of her phone just lying on the side of the road. Which... Damn, they just scooped her up right off the sidewalk, apparently. Now, the chief's call goes a little differently, as his wife picks up the phone, blissfully unaware of the fact that her daughter has been kidnapped. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm glad they skipped the part where the chief tells her, because that's... 
Whew, I, I don't need to see this sweet old lady fall apart like that. Though, I guess that's going to be unavoidable at some point. But yeah, the chief asks about Sayu and Sachiko just tells him that she isn't home right now before the conversation kind of trails off. And while all of this is going on, you just have Ryu in the background chuckling his ass off. <laughs> Looks like things are getting interesting again. And damn, I forgot how cold my boy could be. You'd think that after years of spending time with them, he'd have some sort of connection to them? That he'd care? At least a little? But nah, Ryuk is also a static character in that regard. From day one, these humans have never been anything more than entertainment for him. But yeah, after they both make their respective calls, Light turns to his father and asks him, Dad, are you okay? And I would argue that this is sincere. Like, Light's a piece of shit, I think we can all agree with that. But he's not a complete monster. Like, he's not just indifferent to the fact that his sister has just been kidnapped. He cares. Like, it's obvious that he's upset and angry at what's happened. I honestly have no doubt that he loves his sister and his parents, hence the sincere tone when he asks his father about how he's feeling right now. I mean, shit, right before they got this call, it was him that mentioned the fact that their families could be in danger. If he really didn't care, then he wouldn't have reacted like that once he realized that it was a possibility. Furthermore, after asking his father how he's doing, he goes on to try and protect Sayu again by saying, I think it was Kido who killed the director, not the kidnappers. And the reason I say that he's doing this to protect Sayu is because by leading the task force to believe that Kida killed the director in order to ensure that the NPA couldn't trade the notebook for him, it would mean that Kida found out about the director's kidnapping from someone in the NPA, seeing as they were the only people who knew about the kidnapping. So basically what he's saying is, in order to ensure Sayu doesn't meet the same fate as the director, they need to keep the information between the six of them. And by doing that, there'll be no way the information can make it back to Kira, thus keeping Sayu safe. Because if Kira finds out that these kidnappers have taken Sayu hostage, then he'll kill Sayu just like he did the director in order to keep the death note safe. So yeah, that was smart on his part. He managed to quickly come up with a solution that would, at the very least, give him the chance to try and save his sister. But the fact remains that if he truly wants to keep the notebook out of their hands, then he really only has one option. So what it comes down to is, what's more important? The Death Note or his sister? Anyway, from there we switch back to the SPK, where Nier is being informed of director Takimura's death by one of his agents, a dude named Rester. And the first thing that Nier says in response is, I see. By whom? And this kind of throws Rester off. But another agent, a dude named Giovanni, comments on how it'd be interesting if the person who killed the director was Kira, which Nier immediately agrees with. Nier then goes on to say that, If it is in fact Kira, I can narrow down our list of suspects significantly. Which makes sense. As we've gone over a few times now, the only people who knew about Takimura being kidnapped were members of the NPA. So that means that the suspect pool has gone from the millions of people living in the Kanto region of Japan down to the thousands of people who work for or are directly associated with the NPA. Now from there, Nier pulls out a photo of Mello and asks Rester if he's been able to find his whereabouts, which means he's been looking for Mello. Why? Well, it isn't explicitly stated, but if I had to guess, it's because he wants to know what he's been up to since he left the Whammy's house, and whether or not he's a part of what's going on right now. But unfortunately for Nier, Rester hasn't been able to find anything out. Nier then goes on to think to himself about how Mello's actions are always dictated by his emotions, which is why he foolishly left this photo of himself behind when he stormed off all those years ago. And it's interesting that Nier did him a solid by not leaving it there to be found which kind of makes it seem like he was looking out for him a little. Anyway, from there, we transition to the following morning, as Amelo reaches back out to the chief, claiming that his daughter has arrived in, get this, Los Angeles. Yeah, Mello's out there working with the Mickey Mouse Mafia, which, while I'm being facetious, that is an actual thing. But I digress. Mello then goes on to say, Come to LA, by yourself, and of course, bring the notebook with you. And the chief is basically like, I'm not doing shit until you give me proof of life, which is 100% fair. And Mello goes on to agree to his terms as he goes ahead and sends a photo of her as proof. And it's rough to look at, as her hands seem to be tied up along with her mouth being covered up. And also, 
uh, okay. Well, anyway, they send this picture and they make sure to include an image of a show that's currently broadcasting on a local channel in LA, which is meant to confirm that the picture was taken right now. And while everyone seems to be relieved that she's alive, we see that the chief is still just staring at the picture on his phone, clearly fucking distraught at seeing his daughter like this. Which, yeah, I can only imagine. But anyway, it soon gets to be too much for him, as he gets up and says, I'm taking the notebook to Los Angeles. It's my decision, both as deputy director of the Japanese police force and as Sayu Yagami's father. I'll take full responsibility for the consequences. That's my final word. And I ain't even mad at him, honestly. Like I said it earlier, there was no way he wasn't going to do this. But even still, Light immediately pops up and says, hold up now, Pops, before explaining that he can't just go in half-cocked. And that's also fair. They're gonna need some kind of game plan for how they're going to handle this. And as they begin brainstorming, we head back to the SPK, where the director of the FBI and Nier are discussing the fact that Nier believes that director Kitamura might have been killed by Kira. But the conversation is cut short, as the director gets a call from none other than L himself, which really <laughs> kind of catches him off guard. I don't believe it. It's L. Anyway, Light, acting as L, kinda <laughs> stunts on him a little bit by making it known that he found out John McEnroe's real name. I've already heard what investigator John McEnroe, or rather Larry Connors. And I can understand why he did that. Like, he kinda wants to start this conversation off by establishing that he really is L. And what better way to do that than by showing them that he was able to uncover something that they were trying to hide. But anyway, Light goes on to ask for help with solving Takimoto's murder. But before the director of the FBI can answer, Nier asks him to pass the phone. And before I get into the conversation itself, I just want to point out this little machine that Nier has to mask his voice. I just thought it looked pretty cool and wanted to point it out. But anyway, Nier gets on the phone and, well, says this. I'm pleased to meet you at last, L number two. <laughs> And with a single sentence, we see that Nier has this man shook. And I'm not saying shook necessarily in a bad way right now, but more so like Nier saying that did something to Light. It's kind of like it stoked an old flame inside of him or something. Like they even play the heartbeat effect that typically accompanies heart attacks. Also, I really like the fact that it starts playing Nier's second theme called Nier 2, which in my opinion, sounds even more like Elle's theme than the one from the beginning. And I imagine all of this is purposeful, and I'll explain why in just a second. But anyway, Light's like, the fuck you mean, L number two? And Nier goes on to say, There's really no point in trying to hide it. Before explaining who the SPK is and why they were formed. Even letting Light know that all of their top officials already know that the original L is dead. And Light is, understandably, a little thrown off by this. And this is kind of what I was talking about in the last video, about how becoming L was probably the worst thing he could have done. However, this video's already long enough, so I'll explain more of what I mean in the next one. Anyway, at the end of his speech, Nier finally goes on to properly introduce himself, saying, As for myself, I am at the center of the SPK. You can address me as in. And at this point, Light is actually shook, because after five years of stomping on Goombas, old boy is jumping back into the fray once again. My boys are coming at him like, prepare for trouble and <laughs> make it double. But yeah, as the episode comes to a close, Light ponders on who the hell this in is, claiming that something about him feels very familiar. <laughs> but this strange feeling, what is it? And I love this shot, especially the sound of the chains kind of implying that even after all this time, Light's still chained to this man. It's, it's really awesome. But yeah, uh, with all of that being said, roll credits. Anyway, that's the end of this video, but if y'all are hungry for more content, then come on over to the Patreon. Cause right now the videos for both episode 28 of Death Note and episode three of Code Geass are currently live. And speaking of Patreon, I wanna take a second to thank all the folks over there who helped make these videos possible. Starting things off, I wanna say thank you to our 24 admirable assessors. 
I also want to give a big thanks to all 114 of our invaluable investigators. Now, in addition to them, I want to shout out our eight remarkable researchers. Arrow Falcon Green, Game and Alchemist, Pellets, Staff of the Crystal Serpent, The Best, Trinity Schiffer, Tyrant Link, Vanellian, and Yggdrasil. And lastly, praise be to our eight official overanalyzers. Asia, Cavarax XE, Chicken Wugget, <laughs> Seamart, Croy Raiden, Amelia, I am the blonde asshole, and Joey Helbig. I just want to say thanks again to all of y'all for helping make these videos possible. I genuinely appreciate all the love and support. It really does mean a lot. But yeah, if you like this video, then consider dropping a like. If you really liked it, then consider subscribing. And if you just loved it and want to see more sooner, then consider joining the Patreon. Anyway, that's it for this time. Until next time, friends, peace.